Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome to the to this webinar, um, which is organized by the Kurdish Women's Movement, and which is the last one of uh, of a of a series that uh, took place in the last weeks. And we are currently live streaming on YouTube. My name is Helen, and I will be moderating this event today. Um, it is organized uh, by Jenny Kurdish Women's Office for Peace, and this office is part of Women Weaving the Future, which is a network of different institutions and structures of the Kurdish women's movement. I hope you can hear me. I think there is a problem with the video. No, okay. So, this uh, this webinar today is uh, is the last one of a seminar series on the history theory and practice of the Kurdish women's movement and you will see the poster of this series on the screen here and you can find all these previous seminars too on the youtube channel of women leading the future so you can still watch uh, watch them afterwards and so far, uh, there have been uh, talks on issues like femicide, self-defense, women's autonomy, genealogy, and more. And the women's movement is at the same time also organizing monthly panels with activists from around the world. The next one will take place next Sunday, um, the 20, uh, 23rd of August, uh, same time as today and will be about the topic women's revolution as an antidote to capitalism. So now I will shortly introduce our, uh, our topic today and the speaker. So we know that questions around forms and ways to coordinate and unite women's struggles are not new, but more and more women's movements uh, and organizations are moving to women's internationalism as a way of strengthening the global women's liberation struggle and of fighting together against all forms of patriarchy and of building democratic alliances. And this quest of women's movements from all over the world reflects the changing conditions and opportunities of women's liberation struggle of the 21st century. And the Kurdish women's liberation movement has also been part of this discourse in the recent years, pitching its suggestion for a world democratic women's confederalism and in this webinar, our speaker, Meral Cicic, will talk about this concept and she will address the question why it is necessary for women's movements to further think through the concept and the idea of internationalism and why the Kurdish women's liberation movement believes that democratic confederalism might be a structure and model for building a strong and effective global women's struggle. So now I will shortly introduce the speaker today. Her name is Mera Cicic, and she was born in a Kurdish guest worker family in Germany. She became engaged in politics and women's activism at the age of 16 with uh, the uh, Jenny Kurdish Women's Office for Peace, which is in Düsseldorf. And while studying political science, sociology, and history at the Goethe University of Frankfurt, she began working as a reporter and editor for the, for the only daily Kurdish newspaper in Europe, which is in Politika, and she still writes weekly columns for, for this newspaper. And uh, six years ago, she co-founded the Kurdish Women's uh, Relation Office called REPAC. And she is also, at the same time, an editorial board member of the Genealogy Journal. And yeah, I will I will pass the word to her now. And you during the during the webinar, you will be able to ask questions. Uh, both uh, on YouTube in the comment section and uh, on on Zoom as well. So now I will pass the word to to Meda, and I'm looking forward to our discussion afterwards. Thank you, Helian. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, warm regards from uh, Suleimani from Iraqi Kurdistan. I'm ho I hope that the internet uh, connection will be stable tonight as sometimes we have problems with electricity and if we will lose the connection, we'll try to solve it. 
Uh, so our today, tonight's talk is about women's confederalism or world democratic women's confederalism. Uh, I will try to um, not speak more than half an hour so that we will have enough time uh, to discuss uh, this issue with you, that you will have the opportunity to raise your questions, make your proposals, and I hope that it will be a fruitful uh, discussion for all of us. So within the last years, women's mass protest movements have reached a level that really challenged uh, the patriarchal capitalist world system and its local representatives. For example, the women's self-defense struggle in Kurdistan, Ni Una Menos, One Billion Rising, Aborto Legal, Me Too, um, Time's Up, well, Women's Strike, etc. Parallel to the rise of these mass movements, the question about a feminist international came forth. For example, Feminism for the 99% a Manifesto by Cynthia Arusav, uh, Teeth uh, Bhattacharya and Nancy Fraser underlines that the new feminist wave must be internationalist too, beside being anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-imperialist and eco-socialist. Together with the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, some people remembered that there was something called Black internationalist feminism in the past century. Most recently, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation has published a brochure titled Deconstructing Internationalism Feminist Practices in Conversation, where feminists from different parts of the world discuss the needs and opportunities for a feminist international. All these discussions show us that across borders, women and movements feel the urgent need to unite the rising women's struggles from an internationalist perspective. The discourse about a feminist international or feminist internationalism contains many questions, but few answers about the how and what. Those questions that are raised are about, and now you could uh, show us the second slide uh, where I've written them down also for the participants so that they can read them also. So the questions are mainly about forms and ways. The second slide, please. Yes. So forms and ways of doing feminist politics or understanding internationalism from a feminist perspective. What types of problems are considered relevant and how decisions are made or agreements are built? Ways of connecting that do not establish a bureaucratic logic of political representation, but then how to take decisions. Can there be or should there be institutionalized forms of exchange and decision making? and how to prevent a new form of abstract universalism that dissolves our differences and the, particular, the particularities of each context. How to find ways to act internationally without losing meaning in relation to local concerns. As there are many questions raised, we need to concentrate on giving answers to these questions. We need to produce concrete answers as a result of collective processes. The dis this discussion on a feminist international or women's internationalism is led within the Kurdistan Women's Liberation Movement too. The Kurdish Freedom Movement understood itself as internationalist since the very beginning and always believed in international solidarity and the fraternity or the sisterhood of the people. But especially together with the revolutionary process in Rojava, the Rojava revolution, the women's movement started to rethink the practice of solidarity. The movement itself had received a lot of solidarity from around the world, which was and is extremely precious, precious and meaningful. But when we take into account that the patriarchal system has waged a systematic war against women worldwide, don't we need to stand to these attacks by defending each other and building alliances rather than just showing solidarity? Furthermore, we are all under attack by the patriarchal system in all parts of the world. That means that we need to struggle together. But how? 
The question about networking, building alliances, founding common women's organizations or umbrella organizations, unions, etc., is not new. Since more than 100 years, women from different parts of the world show efforts to transnationalize their struggle for women's rights, for freedom and equality against capitalist exploitation, for peace and against war, etc. May have been and there are numerous regional, continental, international, and transnational women's organizations, networks, leagues, unions, etc. But when we join the discussions at international women's conferences, we almost always witness the expression of the need to build networks, to struggle together, and to unite forces. This shows us that a lot of it, this shows us that a lot, if not most of the umbrella organizations or networks that aim to strengthen the common struggle of women's movements are not as functional and effective as women prefer them to be in coordinating, in showing support and solidarity to each other, in being active and dynamic, in reacting quickly to political developments and attacks on women, in conceptualizing new ways of organizing and creating change. This has different reasons, but it shows us that we as global women's movement have internal and organizational problems. Disconnectedness and fragmentation are obstacles we need to overcome. Besides this, on the mindset level, we have problems that hinder us from uniting our forces, like domination, class attitudes, power and hierarchies, colonialism, racism, nationalism, sectarianism, or centralism. We need to analyze in a radical and courageous way how these kind of attitudes and mindsets build an obstacle in front of the global woman's struggle that crosses borders. We need to analyze the negative impacts of the state mindset and the ideology of liberalism. What marks another big challenge is creating kind of opti optimal balance between the particular or the local and the common or the global. Each woman's group, organization or movement organizes herself and her struggle on her own local group based on local or national, social, political, economical, cultural, etc. agendas. This is just normal and natural. But we are faced with a global system, with a global phenomenon called patriarchy. This system might express its patriarchal, colonialist, capitalist hegemony in different ways and forms. But we need to identify the universality in its particular expressions and its particularities in his universality in order to bring, to build a strong counter hegemony a la Gramsci, Mouffe and Laclau. The struggle for true democracy, ecology and freedom led by women able to overcome the patriarchal capitalist world system can succeed if this woman's struggle carries a universal character and global diameter. Where not everyone struggles on her own and just side by side, but based on an optimal balance between the local and the global or supranational in a coordinated, systematic, organized way, collectivizing experiences and uniting forces. But neither getting disconnected from the outside in one's local sphere, nor sacrificing one's particularity to the common. While doing this, we need to be careful and not fail into the trap of universalism means as women, we do not need to create a new universalism while trying to build a new women's internationalism. But what can be the form of a common struggle of different women's groups, organizations and movements in different places of the world? How to define a democratic understanding of common struggle, which is based on the optimal balance between the local and the supranational, how to develop common mechanisms that do not produce bureaucracy and power relations and are functional. The Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement believes 
that democratic confederalism could be the form to strengthen such a supranational women's struggle. It believes that democratic confederalism might be an answer to the quest for new internationalism and global alliances from the women's front. We could name this world democratic women's confederalism. Democratic confederalism as both a democratic mindset and a democratic relation form stands for the unity of diversities and the togetherness of multiplicities. Multi, multiplicities. It represents the organized power of dozens, hundreds, thousands, maybe ten thousands entities that are autonomous and self special Abdullah Öcalan, the imprisoned leader of the PKK, who theorized the concept of democratic confederalism inspired by Murray Bookchin, defines it as follows. Can we go? Yes. In contrast to a centralist and bureaucratic understanding of administration and exercise of power, conf power confederalism poses a type of political self-administration where all groups of the society and all cultural identities can express themselves in local meetings, general conventions and councils. This understanding of democracy opens the political space to all strata of the society and allows for the formation of different and diverse political groups. In this way, it also advances the political integration of the society as a whole. Politics becomes a part of everyday life. While the nation state is in contrast to democracy and even denies it, democratic confederalism constitutes a continuous democratic process. Democratic confederalism as form or system stands for the active participation of all entities in the common struggle while protecting their own autonomy and originality. Democratic confederalism does not similarize and it does not create new hierarchies and power relations. Instead, it creates multiple flexible but organized commonalities. It's like the chain that flows through the link it compounds. These links do not have the same color or size. They might even have not the same form. Through some of the links, more than one chain flows. Some chains, are sh some chains are short, others are long. This is how democratic confederalism might look like. Democratic confederalism as a structure, on the other hand, is also functional because it helps to dismantle power and domination and to learn democracy. Vertical and horizontal directions converge here. Countless entities form an organizational unit while at the same time maintaining their autonomy. They are not organized hierarchically, but represent an inverted pyramid in the vertical dimension. Horizontally, they are organized together with other entities that are local, either, sorry, either geographically or according to the content. In practice, this means, for example, that a local ecology group organizes itself confederately with ecology groups in other places which are encompassed by a confederate yeah. structure, but at the same time, it also it's also organized on a local level with women's groups, municipalities, cooperatives, elementary schools, youth groups, etc. in councils. In this practice of self-determination and self-administration serves to strengthen democratic politics, which Abdullah Öcalan sees as a unity of collective thinking, discussion, and decision making. The Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement believes that democratic confederalism might be a model for the supranational women's movement too, that it could be an organizational form, a model, a mindset, and form that is based on multiple, multiple horizontal and vertical relations, connections, and alliances, a form that could bring together 
women's struggles and organizations from all around the world that could build bridges on which we can really walk that could unite us in diversity. Maybe we could go to the next slide. Democratic, sorry, World Democratic Women's Confederalism represents a way of building a political system of world women, the primary aim of which is to find solutions to all issues affecting women by collectively strengthening their power of thought, determination and action. This means that World Women's Confederalism would be a political structure in which organized women would think together um, about patriarchal attacks and possibilities for the realization of women's liberation, where they would engage in theoretical and intellectual production, make observations about the situation in the world, work out solutions, make and implement joint decisions. It's not a question of forming a new common umbrella organization on international women's organization. What is needed is a transnational grassroots democracy of women based on a perfect balance between local and global, as well as partial and universal. This is different from a network a federation or union, for example, but it would also not be just a loose entity that comes together from time to time, discusses and diverges again. Rather, we need a mechanism by which the intellectual and practical potential of world women can take concrete shape at the global level and an effective counterforce to patriarchy can emerge. In doing so, we must go beyond everything that has existed so far because we are in, an in a historical phase. Never before in the 5,000 years history of the patriarchate has the women's liberation struggle taken on such a strategic character, has the possibility of realizing the women's revolution been so great like today. World democratic women's confederalism must be based on democratic women's alliances. Alliances can be forged between two forces or movements with the aim of mutual, mutual solidarity, support and cooperation. But in the framework of women's confederalism, building alliances aims the construction of large leagues that have a confederal character inside and relate to each other according to democratic confederalism. It's not very difficult to bring together a number of women's organizations and build an alliance. It's important to guarantee the functionality. For this, it's crucial to find the right form, develop functional mechanisms, democratic methods and processes. This needs discussion and anal analysis as women's organizations and movements, we are all different. We have different ways, methods, and experiences of struggle. In our political, ideological view, we have things in common and we differ from each other. But how to ensure that these differences do not build an obstacle for a common struggle? Around which common uh, denominator, uh, sorry, denominators can we meet? how to handle our differences, based on which principles should we agree together and promise each other, what should be our red lines, and do we need to have red lines as women? What kind of culture of negotiation and alliance do we need? What do we understand when we talk about democracy, democracy freedom, justice and equality? How can we realize our understanding of alliancing first within our own structures? How should the forms of our struggle be? Do we need a common program or strategic roadmap? If yes, how should the language and the content be? What about our action line or organizational model? These questions could be maximized, but important is to create the ground 
for discussing all these questions and more together and by doing so to enlarge the strength of women's struggles on the local and global level. While women are expressing the need for common struggles since more than 100 years, there haven't been enough efforts to develop concrete solutions. The Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement does not offer the prescription why proposing women's confederalism. Democratic confederalism is a system, but the process, the contract, its understanding of alliances, uh, the organizational model of the system and more need to be discussed and decided on collectively. The Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement presented its proposal for democratic confederalism of women for the first time in October 2018 at the International Women's Conference in Frankfurt, which was organized by the network Women Weaving the Future, which is also organizing the series of uh, webinars. This conference, you see there the picture uh, of the opening ceremony with women from different parts of the world. This conference uh, was organized under the title Revolution in the Making and we are looking for an end of the pandemic to be able to start with the preparations for the second international uh, women's conference which should be on the topic about uh, women's confederalism also. In its declaration for this year's 8 March, the KGK, which is Kamal Engine in Kurdistan, the communities of modern of Kurdistan, you see the flag of uh, the organization, uh, addressed the following appeal to the women of the earth. The first principle of the women's liberation struggle is organization. Freedom can't be possible without organization. It is necessary to transform protest into permanent organization. The conditions in this first quarter of the 21st century and the attitude of women make the struggle for freedom a possible challenge. We must therefore take our struggle to a higher level. We must organize our opposition and organize our struggle against the anti-democratic, dictatorial and ruling system. Because if our struggles are not integrated into one form, we cannot change sufficiently. The time has come, however, to make the women's revolution a reality and to turn the 21st century into a time of women's freedom. The conditions are more major than ever. As a Kurdish women's freedom movement, we propose the name World Women's Confederalism for the unification of global women's struggles. The aim of World Women's Confederalism is to improve the global women's sorry, the aim of World Women's Confederalism is to improve the unity of women's struggles by, pre by preserving autonomy. As women's organizations and movements, we should be able to develop common attitudes, overcome divisions, define common struggle strategies and tactics, and indeed cooperate and build common mechanisms. We need to discuss and jointly define the principles of organization necessary for this. So the KJK, whose flag you are seeing now, is the umbrella organization of the Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement, which is organized in four parts of Kurdistan, means in the Turkish, the Iranian, the Iraqi, the Syrian part, but also in the diaspora, like in Europe or in Russia and places like Armenia. Democratic world women's confederalism is not yet a fully developed concept or program. Rather, we are in a discussion process that has been inspired, among other things, by one, the developments of the past years in Kurdistan, especially the revolutionary process in Rojava, the increased participation of internationalists in this process, as well as the reflections of the struggle in Kurdistan in other parts of the world. Secondly, the character of our age the effects on women, and in this context, the possibilities and historical necessity to realize the women's revolution. In addition, there are internal developments of the women's liberation movement in Kurdistan on ideological, organizational, structural, political, and social 
um, level, like, for example, genealogy, the science of women and life. Then the co-chairpersonship, where a man and a woman share uh, the same position on each level. Uh, confederal organization of the women's movement, because, for example, the largest umbrella organization of the Kurdish women um, had renamed itself from KGB, which is Komajin and Belenti High Council of Women, to KJK, Komajin and Kurdistani Communities of Women from Kurdistan, as its extraordinary general assembly mm -hmm. in spring 2014. And this was not just a change of name, but, but a restructuring according to democratic confederalism as conceptualized by Abdullah Öcalan. And accordingly, mm -hmm. the KJK is not only the largest umbrella organization of the Kurdish women's movement, but also a confederal system with a confederal structure. In other words, it's organized in a confederal way. The Kurdish women's movement likes to um, conceptualize and concretize world democratic women's confederalism with her sisters mm -hmm. from all around the world. They want to share their ideas, they want to share experiences, and they really want to, to build the whole process in a collective way mm -hmm. with organized women from all around the world with different backgrounds. And we want to use this webinar also mm -hmm. to get your ideas, um, your proposals, uh, your feedback, uh, maybe your critique uh, on this issue to be able to, to, to start also uh, a collective process of discussion on different levels, uh, maybe also using the internet, but uh, in, um, according to the opportunities, maybe organizing face-to-face -face meetings, uh, conferences, workshops, uh, on this issue to be able really to find a form that would um, fit uh, to all of us and that would uh, be able to, to, to give us the organizational framework uh, to answer to the needs of uh, today's world and to uh, use, uh, make use of the historical um, opportunities uh, to realize uh, women's liberation in the first quarter of the 21st century. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, uh, this very nice and interesting presentation. Um, and we already have uh, two questions that reached us during your, uh, your presentations. And I just want to say in advance that if you uh, have questions, please ask them also on YouTube and also on the Zoom app, you can still ask questions. Um, and as, as we have heard, it is not only um, a theoretical uh, concept, but a very, a very practical issue as well. And so, Please don't be afraid to ask very concrete and practical questions regarding uh, this topic. So uh, I, will, um, I will read the first question. I believe that the Rojava model is unique and the best in the world for all countries to develop fair, just, equal and peaceful societies where women are 50% in decision making via the co-chair system. How can we better promote this model via women's NGOs ac across the globe? Mm. So about the co-chair system, no? Yeah, and how, how this model can be promoted better, in a better way, uh, using women's NGOs or maybe activating NGOs. Mm -hmm. That's what I understood from this question. I think it's very crucial to underline the importance of um, an organized uh, uh, collective force of women to be able to really uh, use this uh, system or model in an effective way, because it's really not just about the physical uh, equal representation of women in decision-making processes, or for example, sharing a power position, you know, because um, it's, it's, it's very functional because through the uh, co-chair uh, system and also uh, equal representation of, and participation of women in uh, mixed structures, 
uh, on all levels uh, of the movement, um, women are changing uh, the culture of politics. They are democratizing it. Uh, they are uh, overcoming uh, centralism. They are overcoming power relations. So it's 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 really functional because it's it's changing. It's not just about ensuring the equal participation of women, mm -hmm. because if it was just about this, so it, if it was just about the quantity, then um, you would have a perfect democratic system in Rwanda, where now uh, I think more than sixty percent of MPs are women. For example, or let's say in Sweden, you no know, people would not commit suicide because they would have a perfect society. So, because of this, I think we should concentrate more on the quality because those women that are co-chairs or representing um, or female representatives are uh, have the mission also to create a change. So that means they are representing the organized collective will of the women's movement means they are chosen by the movement they belong to itself. So the women's movement is educating its members. It's, uh, they, it is empowering them. And according to this, uh, sending them uh, to this uh, posts, for example, or all these uh, mechanisms to represent that uh, ideological, uh, political, uh, social, cultural position of the women's movement itself. So because of this, I think if you just take it as, let's say, uh, having uh, co-chairs, you know, on NGOs, but without the content, you know, if it's just the body without the content, you would not be able to create real change only through women's uh, equal uh, participation or, or representation. Because of this, I think that's very important because all these women that are part of the mixed structures are members of an organized force. And according um, mm -hmm. to this, uh, uh, they are representing the women's movement in the structures. So if you, if you, so the collective identity is very important. And if you just put individuals uh, on that position, for example, co-chairs, Maybe you would create a small change, but not a big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think the second question can be linked to what you said, because it is about the difficulties. Uh, so the question is, what are the main difficulties experienced by participants in the practical day-to-day -day operating of con confederalism in Rojava? Mm. As I'm not based in, in Rojava, I have been there many times, but I'm not based in, in Rojava, so I am not able to talk about direct uh, experiences. But I think in general, you know, this is a process. And when the revolutionary process in Rojava started, uh, the women inside the society were not, uh, you know, it was not so that they were all ready to take uh, for example, um, the, uh, they were not all ready to join the forces of the YPJ or to become co-chairs or to uh, be part of uh, democratic people's councils, etc. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. And because women have been, had been excluded from the political and also social sphere of decision making, in uh, Kurdistan for a long time, especially after the uh, intervention of the nation state, which destroyed um, uh, communal uh, uh, structures of the society where women were playing an active role. Uh, I think that's also very important to, to take notice of that for the woman, it's not, uh, it, it was not and still is not so easy to fulfill this role because they have been, they, they maybe have never been talking in front of the people, you know, uh, they have never been uh, participated in this decision making processes, they have never been a political subject. So through their participation, the whole society is changing also the climate, the culture of the society is changing and the woman, they are so, so it's a it's a dialectical process. And sure, there are many women um, that um, first had to, to, to um, make themselves convinced 
uh, that they are able to 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 participate in politics, that they are able to 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 uh, take responsibility, political responsibility, or responsibility for their society, etc. So it's it's ongoing. But we can see, and uh, in my op in my opinion, we can see a lot of progress if we take into consideration that the uh, revolution just started eight years ago. So within eight years, a lot of things changed and hopefully will continue to change in a positive way. Yes, thank you. We have a third question from the Genealogy Committee, which is, in your view, what could be the next steps? What place would it be good to reach in the foreseeable future? Uh, for what? I will repeat. So in, in your view, what could be the next steps and what place would it be good to reach in the foreseeable future? So for uh, women's confederalism. Yes. I think, uh, so. I think what would be, what, what the women's movement planned also, and it was not, so it had to postpone uh, some um, meetings because of the uh, pandemic. So what the plan was to go to uh, the regions, uh, share the idea or this concept of democratic um, world women's confederalism uh, with organized women from all around the world means Europe, uh, Latin America, Middle East, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, US, especially places where you have a very dynamic uh, women's movement uh, at the moment, because it's really uh, rising uh, in many, many places of the world, to share it and first to discuss it. And when discussing it, I mean, I raised some questions during the talk, but there are many, many questions and we have to be self-critical and we have to reflect our own experiences also, because for example, as movement, and for example, me, myself, and my organization, Repak, we are also representing the Kurdish women's movement and uh, some international, let's say, networks or alliances. And we uh, are not saying that we are outside this problem or let's say the dif difficulties that uh, women's uh, organizations um, live, um, or realize uh, uh, why uh, trying to organize themselves together with uh, other organizations. Because for example, I mean, we have also responsibility. We, we also think, okay, we have to play a bigger role to be able to, to activate uh, those uh, international women's organizations we are part of to play uh, a positive role, to make it more uh, vital, uh, more effective, more dynamic, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And in this sense, I think it's very important first to, um, to uh, analyze uh, the reasons or um, let's say, yeah, what is hindering us from uh, struggling uh, commonly, you know? And then you could answer this question on different uh, levels or base, bases. For example, I mean, there is the a practical uh, level, you know, and then there is the maybe ideological level where it's more about our mindsets because we have the problem of, for example, white supremacy inside the world women's movement also, for example, you know, or sometimes even a woman from a, a leftist or socialist movement may have a colonialist uh, attitudes or mindset, you know, and this is building uh, new walls instead of uh, creating uh, the common ground uh, for a, a global struggle of the women's movement. So because of this, in my idea, in my, in my view, I think it's very important first in a very self-critical and self-reflecting way to analyze the situation of the world women's movement, what are our main difficulties, what are our main problems, obstacles, and by doing so, trying to, to concretize the form, the mechanisms, the principles, the red lines, our program, how we want to fight, what kind of methods we want or instruments we want to use, etc. So it's a long process, but it shouldn't be too long because as I mentioned, we are now in the middle of a very historical uh, uh, phase uh, for um, women's movements worldwide. And because of this, we have to act now and not tomorrow or the day after tomorrow when the situation might be changed also. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have many questions that uh, reach us right now. Um, and I will try to catch up. And I'm sorry that sometimes my display disappears, uh, my screen disappears, because uh, I, I have to read the questions on another app. So uh, the next question is, how does the process Women Weaving the Future and the Kurdish Women's Movement began with the conference in, in Frankfurt link in with other grassroots attempts to bring feminist networks and alliances together? Sorry, can I have it again, please? I missed the second part. Okay, so I will slowly repeat. How does the process, Women Weaving the Future and the Kurdish Women's Movement began with the conference in Frankfurt, link in with other grassroots attempts to bring feminist networks and alliances together? Okay, so um, the aim of the first conference was uh, to create such a network and to create the ground for common struggle. Uh, so if, if we remember, if we go back to the conference and remember the content of the conference, it was really about um, looking for the revolutionary process that is ongoing, or let's say the revolutionary potential for women's liberation. Uh, because sometimes, you know, often revolution is seen as a moment in history. Um, to a cure in the future, you know, in the far future. And, but if you understand revolution as a process, then you can see that it started in the past, is continuing today and will continue in the future, you know? Because of this, the first conference was really about looking how the situation is around the world. Uh, what are the main, um, uh, dynamics in the women's movement um, and trying to develop perspectives for the future common struggle. So it was a start and I think after the conference it was very important and still is important to build um, this network uh, to, 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 um, yeah, to, to, to weave uh, this network uh, further uh, on one side uh, globally but then also in the uh, localities. Mm -hmm. There's uh, I, uh, there is um, mm, a comment by Meredith Tex from the US. I would like to read it because mm -hmm. I think it's also important to share the different views. Uh, she says, I agree with you that we are at a historic movement of change and must take advantage of it. But the history of the women's movement is different in every country. In the US, for instance, during the long period of con conservatism that we are just beginning to emerge from, the feminist movement and the left have developed two different silos with little communication between them. Communications within the left are also underdeveloped. And the young people on the left why they think they are feminists know very little about the actual work of the women's movement. It, is this true in other countries as well? So I don't know, maybe other participants might um, answer to this question, um, but I think it's, it's, it's really true. I think that's also very important, you know, when we talk about internationalism or the character of women's movement in the 21st century, that it should be, um, deeply connected to the main uh, anti-systemic uh, struggles of our mm -hmm. time. For example, you know, uh, you can't disconnect or isolate women's liberation struggle. You know, you need to connect it with, for example, uh, ecology movement, or for example, um, the, the, the struggle of indigenous uh, people, uh, which is for um, true democracy. Uh, or, uh, for example, maybe through the women's movement or through the attitude towards women's liberation, mm -hmm. um, the left uh, and uh, socialist movements might uh, maybe renew themselves also, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's very important. And the women's movement should feel itself also responsible uh, towards all these uh, different uh, movements uh, around the world. Uh, to be uh, on one side to to develop perspectives from a feminist or women's liberationist uh, point of view, 
uh, maybe critique proposals, um, perspectives for the solution of the problems they are uh, confronted with, and then also to, to get inside these movements and to try to build bridges to be able to create a very um, big front of uh, democratic forces against capitalist modernity. So I think maybe one uh, other problem or uh, difficulty we have is, um, or weakness, is um, the lack of responsibility uh, towards uh, mixed structures or other movements outside the women's movement. Mm -hmm. I think you somehow answered uh, one of the next questions, um, but maybe I should still read it. Uh, so maybe you, you want to add something to that. So the question is from the confederalism point of view, how can we uh, have our true women's liberation if the rest of humanity is still under capitalism? How to articulate the gender struggle with the class problem? Mm. Um, you know, um, the Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement views uh, women historically as first class, um, as first slave. Uh, so that means we do not disconnect the gender issue from the class issue. And that's also very important. Uh, without saying one is more important than the other one, you know, but um, we have this point of view that we think that at least all kind of exploitation is, um, is um, how to say, um, uh, concentrated uh, in the existence of women or that, that the gender question or the women's question is the first conflict in history from which uh, other main uh, conflicts um, arose. Uh, but I think um, what I tried to, to um, explain in the beginning also when we were talking about uh, women's uh, um, equal participation and representation in mixed structures. I think I was giving an answer to this question also because you know you organize yourself autonomously as women but you also participate equally in mixed structures representing mm -hmm. this view, uh, this concept of uh, solving problems, of overcoming problems, and creating solutions. Uh, so it's not so that, for example, the women's movement completely disconnects itself from the rest of the Kurdish movement, you know, and says, okay, I'm, I don't care about what's what's happening there inside this political party because I'm concentrating on my women's movement, because the women's movement is continuously also uh, educating and empowering women to be part of the mixed structures. So, so this parallel process is very important. And I think if it's possible to create such a kind of women's of, of world democratic women's confederalism, um, then we would have a very big contribution also uh, on the uh, general uh, struggle against uh, capitalist modernity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, you, you refer to, to mixed structures. And I think the next question uh, also uh, is related to that. So um, we have many questions. So I just try to structure it in a way that they are linked to each other. Uh, the process of building up confederalism means working with people who will have different views and beliefs from us. How do we balance working across differences with maintaining our values? How do we decide what our red lines are, who we can work with and who we cannot work with? So in, in my view, there should be red lines. For example, fascism would be a red line, you know? I mean, we cannot work with a, with a fascist woman, you know, for example. Yes. Uh, so I, I believe that there should be some red lines of the women's movement. Uh, but on the other side, I think it's also, I mean, this is, um, these questions can't be answered in a very concrete way because it's really, I mean, this is what we are talking about, you know, we, we want to explore it really. I mean, how to handle differences, you know, in a theory, it's very easy to explain it, but then in practice, uh, when you bring together so different views, um, 
cultural cultural attitudes also cultural backgrounds um, different experiences you know and then also let's say political lines ideological lines um, how to create a kind of uh, culture of uh, politics of women's politics where all these uh, differences would not uh, separate us from each other mm -hmm. uh, and i think this would be kind of revolutionary process itself because there is no model you know we can't say okay let's do it like i don't know people have done it 200 years ago because we are in a completely different situation mm -hmm. uh, because we are more and more mixed you know 200 years ago people did not live in such a mixed way for example you know and in the future we will get mixed more and more so how to handle it and i think that women really have to to develop a kind of new culture you know of democracy of uh, mutual uh, understanding of of mm -hmm. um, of respect also you know to give these terms a kind of new uh, content to create mm -hmm. emotions also and and this is what we really want to to discuss together we don't have yes uh, the answers to these questions we have to explore it together mm -hmm. but i think there are a lot of resources that might nourish us in this process you know because you know uh, for example in places where capitalist modernity was not able to destroy all um let's say communalist or social structures like for example indigenous people in latin america for example you know mm -hmm. where still have a lot of Uh, on um, uh, or communalist uh, mechanisms and the culture is very um, uh, uh, vital still, uh, we can learn a lot from. Then, for example, Meredith was, um, was uh, mentioning uh, the US, you know, and I think that's also important to make a kind of research of the experiences of women's movements and women's organizations in different places of the world in the past, you know, how did they work together? Is, is there any experience that we could uh, take as a kind of model uh, or on which we can work on? And I think there is, there, there should be a lot of experiences also in history. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... We have a lot of questions and I think two of them are a bit similar. So I will try to pose the next question in a, in a combined way. Uh, so I will try to combine the two questions. Uh, so what strategies for organizing in heavily, heavily patriarchal and religious societies? What specific type of challenges arise and how, of, how challenges, sorry, What specific type of challenges arise and how to overcome them? And the other question, which I think is related to that is, I have learned that men are educated to kill the man. My question is, can you talk about the education process and how to deal with patriarchal issues within the movement and men's reaction to it? Okay, maybe I should start with the second question. So that, that uh, inside in, in the second half of the 90s, uh, no, sorry, in the second half of uh, the millennium years, so after 2000, in the first, sorry, first half of 2000, uh, in the guerrilla, in the Kurdish guerrilla of the PKK, the women's movement that um, organized itself not completely autonomously uh, started to... Um, to organize special formations for male guerrilla fighters. So that means the project was to uh, analyze and uh, overcome uh, the patriarchal mindset, uh, male power uh, in uh, their thinking and ways of feeling uh, to be able to liberate themselves because uh, liberation is not just an issue of the woman, uh, also men have the need to, there is the need for The transformation of the man also to be able to to overcome uh, the whole patriarchal um, uh, mentality. So that means that the women's movement asked the male guerrilla fighters that wanted to join such a formation to write a report with their reasons why they want to. Uh, then uh, the leadership of the women's movement would uh, read these reports and decide on those who can uh, join the formation 
uh, that took about a year. So that means that 20, about 20 male guerrilla fighters uh, uh, went to the uh, headquarter of the women's movement and lived uh, together with them uh, for a year where they had different um, levels of formation uh, and where women helped the male comrades uh, to analyze how the system is reproducing itself in their mindsets. So mm -hmm. and they had two formations, if I'm not wrong, one in 2003 and one in 2004 until 2005, and they published a lot of books. So they, they published the discussions and also the self-analysis of the men and also mm -hmm. the critique and self-critique platforms of them and reports to be able to collectivize uh, these uh, experiences and share it uh, with the whole movement. So, and um, that was um, a project that was uh, actually already started in the 90s by the leader of the PKK, Abdullah Öcalan, who um, uh, analyzed the question of the man or patriarchal uh, power uh, under the title killing the man. And when he was saying killing the man, he was not, he did not mean the physical existence of the man, but it was the mindset, you know, to, 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 to overcome it. So that was the main issue. And I mean, today, when the women's movement is organized totally autonomously, you know, where it's taking all uh, her decisions by herself without any male intervention, um, the standards of uh, attitudes uh, towards a women's liberation changed a lot. So it's not soft. We cannot say that the gender question is soft within the Kurdish movement, but it reached a very high level and the struggle inside means the gender struggle and also the class struggle within its own militants is uh, continuing also in a very radical uh, ideological way when we think about the analysis they are doing. So this is the continuing process. Uh, for the first question, I would first like to underline that I would not uh, say that um, religion itself is a problem. So I wouldn't uh, name uh, religious uh, societies as a problem or I would not name it next to a uh, patriarchal society uh, because religion itself, I mean, if you look from a cultural perspective, uh, embraces a lot of social values. Um, that we need also as a society. And people, need, there are a lot of people that feel the need to believe, and this is okay. You know, you can have dogmas, but what is uh, problematical is the issue about dogmatism and also religious dogmatism. And there mm -hmm. is another issue when you use uh, religion uh, for power, when you, when you instrumentalize it, you know, and this is called also by our movement, religionism. And, uh, you have a lot of sectarianism also. So because of this, I wouldn't call religion to be, um, I wouldn't say that it's a problem itself to be religious. Uh, it's something else if you're radicalized or if religion becomes an instrument of uh, male power. So uh, I wanted to, to say this and I think that's very important to challenge the patriarchal mindset and not just the patriarchal mindset because mm -hmm. this is also very important. You know, it's not just about the masters, it's also about the slaves. So you have to, to take into consideration you have this patriarchal mindset that is creating uh, traditional roles for men and women. And you have also the woman that uh, influences uh, a lot of um, sexist, uh, misogynist, uh, patriarchal um, mindset and attitudes that actually do not belong to her, you know, but she has them. And uh, through, through them, uh, the male system is also able to, to, um, to divide women and rule on them. Mm -hmm. So because of this, it's very important not just to challenge patriarchy and the mindset of man, but mm -hmm. sexism itself, you know, social sexism. And we need to liberate our minds, both women and men. And through doing this, we will be able to create or to, to democratize society and to liberate ourselves. So it's a question of both men and women. Yes. Yes, the last point is very important, I think. So we have two final questions. And I think after the, these questions, we should, uh, we should come to the end. Um, and also, as you know, uh, there have been other seminars in the last weeks and uh, you can you can watch and listen to them on YouTube. So because I think many questions are related also to the topics that we have 
uh, discussed in the in the previous um, uh, seminars. So uh, the one question um, is already uh, halfway answered. Uh, so the person that uh, that asked the question uh, said that uh, you already somehow answered the question, but I still want to read it. So. If I am understanding correctly, the Kurdish movement sees themselves as organizing society, not subcultures. How can we reach people that don't, don't come from the left or socialist tradition, or that may be apolitical or even conservative? This is the first question. Maybe you have some uh, remarks on that. And then there is also a comment again by Meredith. Um, Perhaps we should think of this period as one of scientific experimentation since there is no model. Clearly, electronic communications will be key, but can we develop other kinds of practice? Can we set up a few case studies where we try different things in one context or the same thing in different contexts? I would agree. I mean, if, you, if, you need a rep, if you need me to repeat it. No, no, I, I totally agree to Meredith. Mm -hmm. And um, for the question before, uh, uh, yes, the Kurdish movement um, aims to organize the society uh, or to, to, to create the ground where an organized society is able to, to express itself to um, be active political subjects. You know, this is, and for example, I mean, if you look at the society in Rojava, these people, you know, they wouldn't, um, I don't think that all of them would uh, call themselves uh, leftists. Mm -hmm. you know, they are very conservative people, they are very religious people, uh, there are people who maybe come from a different political tradition, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, when it's more, because you are not, you, you don't understand revolution as creating a new society. You know, because then you would disconnect yourself from the society because you would position yourself above the society. You are the perfect militant. You are the revolutionary mm -hmm. who transformed itself and liberated itself from the system, etc. And then there's the society that needs to be created again. You know, and this is not about, this is not the understanding of the revolution in Rosh Alba. And it's really about um, building the ground for a, uh, ethical, uh, political society that is able to realize democratic politics, what is about commonly discussing, taking decisions, and also implementing these decisions, you know? So because of this, there can be people from different backgrounds, there can be religious people that uh, are together member of a uh, let's say commune or people's council with socialists, with Trotskyists, with very uh, religious people, with feminists, uh, with Arab people, Kurdish people, Armenian people, you know, because it's really not about to giving all of them the same political view, but it's about creating a kind of acceptance for each other, a mutual mm -hmm. respect and common understanding of democracy and politics. Mm -hmm. And what they data decide on is their issue. Important is that you create the ground for them to be able to, to, um, to become again political subjects. Mm -hmm. And in this issue, I think it's okay. Not all people need to have the same background. Yes. Conservatives with the other. It's good to have all these different colors. Mm -hmm. Had only people thinking in the same way, you wouldn't have any progress anymore. Mm -hmm. any democracy freedom, yes. etc. you know, wouldn't be realized. So because of this, you need diversity uh, in uh, order um, to, to, to have an organized society also. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. I think the strength of the, of the Kurdish movement and all the movements that are in solidarity uh, with the Kurdish movement lies in the organization of diversity. So to be able to organize people from, who are not homogeneous, but uh, from different backgrounds. Yes. yes, I think it's very important. Conflict. No, for example, in Rojava or in Northern Syria, they are now experiencing that some local uh, councils do not agree with, uh, let's say the social contract of Rojava. 
Mm -hmm. because of um, women's issues, for example, you know? And I mean, this is the process. You don't have a ready answer to these conflicts, you know, or solutions, okay? You can Mm -hmm. solve the question in this way because, I mean, if you look from their perspective, they might be right also because they, they, they are still very influenced, you know, by the patriarchal um, understanding of religion also, you know, but you also have already a lot of women uh, in these uh, councils that want this social contract to be implemented, you know, and it's mm-hmm. so interesting also to follow uh, this uh, process to look what kind of dynamics occur and how these people handle these questions and uh, solve the difficulties. And I think this is really uh, interesting and important and maybe not enough reflected also outside or maybe also inside our own society. Maybe we do not uh, discuss enough uh, on uh, these issues. But I think that's very important, you know, because there are a lot of uh, lessons we can take from also to look and maybe the solution is not uh, the ideal one from your perspective, but it's it's a process, you know, and it's it's still transforming and changing, and that's inter- that's what revolution is also about. Mm-hmm. I think this is a good point to to end uh, end our today's webinar. I hope you uh, we could uh, together answer to to all the questions. Uh, by by those who were listening today uh, first of all uh, thank you for for your uh, talk and uh, for answering all the questions and also thanks for uh, the participants uh, thanks to the participants uh, for joining us today and um, yes as i said before you can follow uh, also the uh, the social media uh, of or all also websites of the network Women Weaving the Future and other institutions and organizations uh, related to the Kurdish women's movement. Uh, Here you can see uh, the poster for next week's uh, seminar, which is about uh, women's revolution as an antidote to capitalism. And we hope that we will meet again uh, next week, uh, same uh, same time, uh, 7 p.m. And uh, yes, thanks to, uh, to all of you um, for joining today and have a nice uh, evening. Do you have some final remarks? No, thank you very much for organizing this uh, panel series and we are looking forward how to continue uh, also um, this format uh, in the next future. Yes, okay. So hope to see you soon and uh, good evening to everybody.